Hello. I just wanted to start out by saying how grateful I am to be here today with all of you and that while I'm sad we're not able to be together in person, I'm really grateful for this digital platform and the way that it allows us all to still meet up in a sense. So, as the slide says, my name is Jordan Eldridge and a little bit about me. I started out life as a classical singer who had sort of a hobbyist's interest in programming. And over time, that interest gradually evolved into uh, a professional career. And today I work at Facebook where I have the privilege to help build the GraphQL client relay. But today's talk is not about my work. Um, it's about that sort of hobbyist approach to programming. About seven years ago, I started hacking on a project called WebAmp. And WebAmp is, it's a, a very meticulous recreation of the sort of Napster era MP3 player software WinAmp. And it's implemented entirely in the browser, in TypeScript actually. Um, but one of its goals when I first started out was for it to challenge people's expectations of what was possible in the browser. And in order to sort of deliver on that, I set this constraint for myself that everything it did would have to be done in the browser. So it's just some static files on a CDN and every interaction you have with it is an interaction you're having with your browser. And I think the sort of most clear way that it demonstrated that like aha moment of challenging people's expectations about what kinds of things browsers can do was its ability to parse and interpret Winamp's theme files or what it called skins. So Winamp could support these, um, these custom skin files, which users could create and mash up and distribute and share. And people did fervently. Um, and WebAmp, you can drag one into your browser, a file that you downloaded in the um, early 2000s and uh, it'll pop up in your browser and the whole UI will become, um, you know, reskinned to use this new theme. So that's just like maybe the, the painting the picture of what WebAmp is. And I said that I've been working on this for seven years and that's true in, in a sense, but really what it's been is this project has been sort of my window into a lot of other sub projects where um, like one aspect of implementing WebAmp required like a very interesting discrete sub problem being solved or meta projects where WebAmp formed one building block in a larger project. So I'd like to just give a little overview of a few of those to get you a sense. So for example, um, WinAmp skins can include animated cursors in them in the Windows ANI format and browsers can't render ANI, at least not modern browsers, um, and they can't actually even render animated cursors. So was forced to sort of confront these problems and find a solution. And, and what I ended up coming up with was I could extract the frame and timing data from the ANI file and construct a CSS keyframe animation, which would allow me to animate the cursor attribute of the arbitrary you know, DOM node. Um, and by doing this, we were able to take um, all these Winamp skins we had and any of them that had these animated cursors, if you look closely here, you can see there's this like Mario uh, skin that has animated cursors. And, um, and we were able to sort of bring these animations to the web and make them accessible again. And this theme of making the Winamp skins accessible was something I did not anticipate, but really ended up being one of the most interesting parts of the project. So uh, here we worked, I worked with the Internet Archive. We collected now 72,000 Winamp skins and um, made those available in the browser, both for preservation, you know, preserving the sort of iconic moment of amateur art and um, like design aesthetic of the early 2000s. And also just, you know, preserving, making them available online for an audience who you know, maybe doesn't have Winamp installed. 
And then once we had collected all these skins, I was like, hmm, I wonder what you could do with all this data. And so I tried um, training a machine learning model to generate new Winamp skins. Uh, the results were interesting, although not quite um, as satisfying as I would have wanted. But today, what I want to talk about specifically is what I think is WebAmp's most technically interesting subproject, um, and that is the story of how we significantly sped up, sped up WebAmp, WebAmp's visualizer um, by making a compiler written in TypeScript, which runs in the user's browser. And by doing this, we were able to not only speed up the visualization, but also um, get better security guarantees. So I think this was just such an interesting project to work on. So I wanted to share a bit about what we built, um, share why we ended up taking this unusual approach of running the compiler in the browser, a little bit about how we built it, and finally share some of the surprising things that we learned about WebAssembly um, while we were sort of getting our hands dirty with the actual you know, instructions. So before I can explain exactly what we did, I'd like to explain first a little bit about Winamp's visualizer um, and how we were porting it to the web, and also just a bit about WebAssembly for anyone who's unfamiliar. So Winamp's iconic visualizer was called Milk Drop. And around the same time I was starting WebAmp, actually I think a little before, another Jordan, coincidentally, another uh, engineer named Jordan, Jordan Berg, was working on a project to bring Milk Drop to the web. And he called his project Butter Churn. And eventually we would meet up and through this sort of shared <laughs> uh, interest, and we would end up getting Butter Churn integrated into WebAmp which was just like, to me, felt so cool to have. Um, and, and through that uh, relationship, we then ended up embarking on this project, which was this compiler where I wrote the, types, the compiler written in TypeScript and uh, Jordan Berg integrated it into Butter Churn. So I said that Milk Drop was Winamp's visualizer, but I think calling it a visualizer is actually selling it a bit short because in reality, it's actually an interpreter of music visualizer presets. So users could write their own presets in a combination of GPU shader code and this language called EEL, which you see here on the screen. And Milk Drop would then take the sort of equations that you defined, that the user defined, and execute them at different phases um, to, to create the visualization. So for example, you could define an equation which would run on each shape or on each vertex or on each, um, on, even on each pixel. It wasn't quite pixel, but you, you get the idea. These are running very frequently. Um, and so we have this user-defined code that we need to be able to execute every frame of the animation in order to keep this live uh, visualization ticking along. And in the browser, that's no easy task, right? JavaScript has gotten very fast, but even still, this is user generated code. So there's like a little extra overhead here. And so this is the part that we were um, aiming to compile to WebAssembly to take advantage of some of the characteristics of WebAssembly. So now that we've covered what uh, Milk Drop is and sort of how it worked in the browser a little bit and what we were trying to achieve, let me give a little overview about WebAssembly. So for anyone who's not familiar, WebAssembly is another language that modern browsers support in parallel with JavaScript, which uh, consists of high level assembly instructions, which map pretty closely to the machine instructions on the various CPU architectures. So the idea is that when you load a WebAssembly module, the computer executing it is going to be able to get sort of near, near native performance because it's going to be executing basically uh, machine instructions. Not quite, but pretty close. Um, unlike JavaScript, which is distributed as you know, source text, WebAssembly is distributed at, in a binary format. Um, so it's sort of the, the compiled artifact that you send to the users. 
Um, it has only numeric data types, so there's no strings, no arrays, no objects, only floating point numbers, integers, and linear memory. And so anything more complex than that, you need to structure it yourself out of those primitives. Um, and it's sandboxed. So this is actually a really interesting property of WebAssembly, um, but it basically, a WebAssembly module only has access to its own memory and any additional interaction it wants to have with the host environment uh, must be done explicitly. And I'll get into a little bit more about that later. So we've covered EO, we've covered WebAssembly. Now let's see how we sort of tried to put them together with TypeScript in the middle. So what we did was we wrote a compiler uh, in TypeScript, which takes this eel visualizer's text source code, parses it, and then emits the WebAssembly binary on the other side. So it's sort of this like pipe, right? And once we have that WebAssembly binary in the browser, it's sort of identical to if we had just downloaded that binary from a server somewhere. And so we can take that, pass it to the um, WebAssembly instantiation um, methods in the browser to construct a new WebAssembly module, which we can then begin um, executing in these hot loops in order to get the um, animation going. So by taking this approach, we were able to get visualization rendering um, to get the rendering 73% faster. And thanks to the WebAssembly sandbox, which I mentioned, we were able to get significantly more um, uh, security guarantees along the way. Now, this approach of running the compiler in the browser is not usual, right? Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the constraints of this project that led us to, um, to that approach. So the sort of Venn diagram of constraints that overlapped are one, the source of the thing we want to execute is not known at build time, right? We don't know about all possible visualizer preset presets uh, when we're building our app. We want to be able to support the ability to like drag in a preset which we've never heard of before, or even um, one day a, a live editing experience where you can make a change to the preset and then it would sort of update and you'd be experiencing it live in your browser. Um, the other condition is that this code is not trusted, right? We'd like to be able to load a preset from a URL hosted on the Internet Archive, um, but we don't want to necessarily have to trust that no one has uploaded a malicious preset to the Internet Archive. Um, our code must run synchronously. So one approach we looked at was, well, maybe we could compile to JavaScript, um, which actually was the original approach that we had before, um, but we could compile to JavaScript and then run that in a web worker to get improved security. Um, but with that model, you can only run that task asynchronously via uh, message passing. So finally, the last thing is just, it has to be fast. So an approach like an interpreter was also sort of not ideal because you would have to pay that overhead of an interpreter. Okay, so that's our justification for taking this approach. Um, now I'd love to share some sort of concrete details of how we went about doing it um, so that if this should be something you're interested in, you would have some idea of where to get started. So here you can see sort of the heart of our compiler. It's a little bit of a simplified um, version of it. I've left out some details, but it's honestly not so much more complicated than this. So first of all, we take the source text and we parse it to an AST. Um, we're using JSON, which is a um, sort of parser generator where you define the grammar of the language and it um, generates the JavaScript code for a parser. And so we take that AST, this abstract syntax tree, um, which is like a you know, tree structure of representing the, the hierarchical structure of the code. And we sort of recursively call this emit function on it. So for example, you look at a binary expression, we're going to take, okay, whatever the left-hand side of that binary expression is, say it's two plus three. We're gonna take the two on the left and get the, um, the binary code, WebAssembly code for that. And then we're gonna take the 
right-hand side of that operation and get the WebAssembly code for that. And then we're gonna find the operator and we're gonna like jam it all together. Um, and you can see here, this function just returns a JavaScript array of numbers. This is like definitely very wasteful um, the way we're, we're doing it, but the programs tend to be very small and this keeps our compiler very simple. Um, so it's been a great fit for us. So let me explain this in another way to make it just a little bit more clear what's going on here. So we have this expression two plus three. We pass it through our parser, which gives us an abstract syntax tree, right? We have our binary expression with a left side, a right side, and an operator. Now, uh, each of those maps to some set of WebAssembly instructions, some sort of array of WebAssembly instructions. And so that's sort of what we do. We emit them and each um, emit call ends up creating, figuring out which instructions correspond to it. So in this case, a two is the const two instruction, right? A const with an immediate of two. Um, and the three is const three. Now, WebAssembly is a stack machine. So what that means is um, you, you write instructions which write values to a stack, and then you write instructions which consume values off the stack and perhaps return some values on the stack. So really what we want to do here is we want to push a two on the stack, push a three on the stack, so we now have two and three on the stack, and then push add, call add, which will consume those two values and leave behind the, the total five on the stack. And so this is sort of the code that we're building up. Um, now I've written this like I32 const, but really what that is is that's like our internal function which returns an array of the bytecode for I32 or the opcode I mean for I for the I32 const, followed by the encoded immediate literal two. So you can see here, um, it just so happens that um, OX41, the hex 41 is the uh, opcode for I32 const, and then we encode the literal two, we encode the literal three, and then OX4A is the hex code for the add instruction. And so, yeah, we're just building up these numbers. We use spread operators to sort of recursively build up larger and larger arrays. Again, this is not terribly efficient compiler engineering, um, but it works really well for our use case. And as we recursively build up this array, eventually we take that value, construct a uint8 array out of it, and that becomes the binary blob that is our WebAssembly module. So that's a lot, I understand. Um, but now I'd like to talk a bit about what we learned. So it was really interesting getting to work with WebAssembly in this way. I think most people who get to try things out with WebAssembly are mostly configuring existing compilers to emit WebAssembly. And so I was really pleased to get to sort of get my hand, have an excuse to get my hands dirty with like, how does the actual language work? How does the actual, what kinds of instructions are there and, and you know, what, what's easy to do and what's hard to do with that approach? So one thing that was hard to do was trigonometry. So I had never looked at any of these things before. I'd never uh, written anything in assembly. Um, and it didn't occur to me that, you know, well in JavaScript, you know, uh, math.sign is just a function, you just call it. And um, that in WebAssembly, that is not a thing that just exists. You would have to construct it yourself. And it's not at all trivial to construct it yourself. And so we went back and forth on how we were gonna sort of do this where we're going to try to you know take some other implementation of the sign function and like build it into our compiler we really weren't sure um but what we ended up doing was just injecting them from the host environment so WebAssembly modules can define some imports that they expect and we just say hey we expect our host environment to pass us in some functions we can call and when we want the sign of a number we sort of call out to the host environment and that host environment will will return us the return value. And here I think is the biggest thing we learned that boundary crossing in WebAssembly is really like the 
the key to figuring out how to get performance out of WebAssembly is reducing how much boundary crossing you need to do. So I mentioned that WebAssembly is a sandbox language. And sort of the way it works is the WebAssembly module has its own memory um, and only it has access to that memory. Um, but there are ways to interop with the host environment. So in the browser, that would be JavaScript runtime. So for example, it can import and export a linear memory, which is just like an array buffer. Um, it can import and export globals, which are just like named numeric variables and import and export functions. So it can say, you know, I expect a sign function to be passed into me, or I expose a function to, you know, compute the Fibonacci sequence or something like that. So each of these though, because it's sort of traversing into and out of the sandbox comes with some performance overhead. And we hit this hard. <laughs> we thought that our use case was just so well aligned with WebAssembly, but it turns out it was not so simple. Um, we had this problem where milk drop, um, the way that the, the preset functions are defined, they basically expect some number of global variables to be reset before each of the functions runs. And so you can see here, like we were having to reset like a hundred variables inside this hot loop before running the eel code each time. And that was really, really slow. And the solution we found, I think was actually really, really interesting. Um, and the best part about it is that I get to talk about how we solved it, which is using assembly script. So assembly script, if you haven't heard about it, and I'm very happy to get to talk about it here at TSConf um, for anyone who hasn't, is a subset of TypeScript which can compile to WebAssembly. So you can see here it's type annotated just like TypeScript, but the types are I32, which is a type that is native to WebAssembly. So what we did is we wrote a assembly script module to live alongside our um, runtime generated WebAssembly module. And we went from this model where we had um, all the global resets being done in JavaScript to a model where the uh, assembly script module was doing the resetting. So we would take our global values and pass them into the um, eel WebAssembly module, but we would take those same global values and pass them into the assembly script WebAssembly module. And the assembly script Web WebAssembly module had functions in it like reset all globals, and it would iterate through and reset them all. And what we found was while the JavaScript uh, host environment pays a penalty to reset those globals, having two separate WebAssembly modules, which both access the same globals, you do not pay that same boundary crossing overhead. And so it was basically the same price as doing that resetting inside our compiled module, the one we compile in the browser. Um, so I thought that was just a very interesting sort of trick, which I can't imagine um, has come up that often in other people's work. So having shared sort of those interesting learnings about WebAssembly, I think the big takeaways are, one, it can make sense to run a compiler, to download and run a compiler in the user's browser. Um, the use cases I can think of are of course ours, but maybe also if you want some kind of um, domain specific language in your web app and it needs to run fast like ours does. Um, or maybe you're running like a um, developer tool playground or some kind of environment where you want developers to be able to try out a language. I could imagine it being useful in an environment like that as well. And then I think the other big takeaway is just that WebAssembly is only fast if you can minimize the boundary crossing. Um, so any kind of uh, WebAssembly is not just like a, a magic solution to performance problems. It's really only well suited to problems where you don't need to be sending a lot of data back and forth across that boundary, especially not structured data, um, be that, you know, objects or arrays or even, even global variables or variables. So I'd just like to end today with a reflection on side projects and specifically sort of um, novelty side projects. I think projects like this have the ability to lead us off the beaten path into, I guess, like the wilderness where these sort of more interesting programming challenges lie, ones which 
haven't been sort of um, optimized to death by people who are who are smarter than you. Um, and I think you know this is a set of these are a set of problems which have been just hugely fun to get to think about. And I I would just highly recommend that if you find yourself looking for um, uh, another side project. I would just encourage you to look outside of, you know, side hustles and, you know, NPM developer packages to something that is more whimsical and um, sort of more out there and different. And so I've spent a whole talk talking about a music visualizer and I have not given you a taste of it. Um, my experience has been that on live streams, the frame rate is just insufficient. Um, to sort of do justice to the work that my friend Jordan Berg has done. Um, so I would encourage you to go to webamp.org. Please check it out, try it out for yourself. If you're curious about the compiler and its TypeScript source code, you can play with a playground of the compiler at eel.capt.dev, and there's a link to the GitHub from there. And finally, just a thank you to Jordan Berg for your amazing Butter Churn project, and thank you so much for um, this collaboration and integrating this compiler into it.